I want to begin a series today here at this campus uh, entitled The Trauma Trap. The Trauma Trap. And today I want to preach a message. Help me preach. Lift your voice and say, Lord, clip my wings. Lord, clip my wings. I want to talk to us for a moment because I think that this is a necessary, bless you musicians, a necessary transition uh, because those of you that were here with us on Tuesday night, and let me put a plug in there, uh, Tuesday nights uh, are can't miss over here at Spirit and Truth. Uh, we, we are not just the Sunday morning church, but we grow on Tuesdays. And uh, we've moved our midweek Bible study right here to the temple. So all y'all here, you know how to get here and everything. Uh, be here Tuesday at 7. But we, we touched on something that uh, I know the Lord gave me on Tuesday. But I did not fully understand at the onset uh, the level of engagement it was going to get. The number of text messages it was going to elicit. The number of calls that were going to come in. As a result of what we dealt with on Tuesday surrounding the idea, help me preach, we're on the same team today. Everybody say trauma. Trauma. Trauma, trauma is a term, it is a word that is uh, used quite frequently now and to best describe trauma, we would refer to it as uh, the response to a deeply disturbing or distressing event. That's what trauma is. It is a response to a deeply disturbing or distressing event. There are some that when you hear trauma, you immediately and exclusively think of the physical. Uh, you think of physical trauma. You think of something happening to your mortal body. But the truth of the matter is, and I need some real folk to co-sign this with me, trauma is not limited to your physical body. Am I in the right church over here today? Uh, but trauma, if you really want to talk about it, can impact you mentally. Trauma uh, can have an emotional manifestation. Trauma can have spiritual and mental manifestations. And I'm going to say something again, and I need you to get this in your notes and in your spirit. Because while we're oftentimes only thinking about trauma in the sense of physical, oftentimes it is the wounds that you can't see that hurt more than the ones you can. Mm. It's the wound that you smile over. It's the wound that you do all that shucking and bucking and hucking and, and running and dancing and flipping and rolling on the floor trying to hide and mask. Sometimes it's that trauma that hurts more than what you've endured in your body. You can talk to psychologists and they'll tell you, Evan, that we were not designed. We were not Built. We were not engineered by God to process trauma on the rate that most of us are receiving it. Some of you uh, would push back and say, well, pastor, you know, life ain't never been no crystal stare. We've always had to deal with trauma. My grandparents dealt with trauma and they did. Your great grandparents dealt with trauma and they did. But what previous generations did not have to deal with is the trauma from all of the world. Yeah. Yeah, you, you had to deal with what was happening in your neighborhood, but now because of the internet and because of streaming platforms and social media and mass media, you're not only hearing about your own issues, but you've got to constantly be bombarded and inundated with trauma all over the world. This bombing just happened. This just took place. This mass shooting just occurred. This person just died. All of it is coming at us constantly around the clock and the truth of the matter is most of us in this room are traumatized on a level that we have not acknowledged don't look around but I'm talking to some of y'all in this room this is going we're going we, we, I'm glad we danced already because I got to talk to you now there are people in this room that have been abused there are people in this room that have been traumatized by uh, sexual assault there are people come on let's be a grown-up church today there are people that have been traumatized by the side effects of divorce and relationships that did not go right you put all 
all of you in and left with nothing and it has shaken some of you but I want to challenge you to understand that if you're under the sound of my voice and you have wrestled with or are wrestling with the side effects of trauma I want to encourage you by telling you that everybody that God used greatly had to overcome some degree of trauma can I talk to somebody in here? Read your Bible. I know that we like to pretend that these are all stained glass characters living perfect lives, but the people in Scripture had to deal with some of the same traumas you did. You don't believe me? Ask Abraham who had to deal with the trauma of separation because God told him to leave his father's house and his familiar and go to a land that he would show him. Ask Abraham about trauma when he had to walk around with the name Abraham. Abram that meant high father although the whole time he didn't have a child year after year day after day he had to subject himself to hearing a name on him that did not match what he had in him oh God talk, talk about trauma talk about okay you don't like Abraham Abraham had a son his name was Isaac you want to talk about trauma let's deal with the intergenerational construct that, that he had to wrestle with when he laid there on an altar and his daddy tied him down and then raised a knife over his throat and only stopped watch this at the sound of a voice that Isaac could not hear you, you want to talk about trauma Isaac left and we never see Isaac and Abraham together again come here until Isaac and Ishmael come to mourn Abraham because all this time Isaac been living at his mama's house so somebody say trauma Mm, you want to talk about trauma okay don't just limit it to the brothers in the church let's look at some of the sisters in scripture I know that we've made her a bad character for some reason but Bathsheba could talk to you about trauma uh, I'm gonna lose some help but that's all right I'll find some more uh, we've made her this scandalous character that went out and tried to trap a rich powerful man when in reality Bathsheba was the victim Oh, I'm out here now. I hear some of y'all. Uh, David survived Goliath but couldn't survive. He lost to Bathsheba. No, 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 no. David didn't lose to Bathsheba. David lost to David. Y'all not going to talk to me in here. She was a casualty of his lack of conviction and misplacement. But yet and still, she had to deal with the trauma the rest of her life. Ask Tamar, the victim of, a, uh, of an incestuous assault at the hands of her own brother. Ask her about trauma. Ask David about trauma. Ask, uh, ask the disciples about trauma. Ask Daniel, locked up in a lion's den, about trauma. But can I talk to you and tell you that if they could come out of their trauma, touch your neighbor and say, so can you. Ah, uh, yes, God. And this is what leads me to this conversation today because uh, it's important that we understand that trauma elicits several responses. Most of you in the room would understand that there are usually four Fs. That's what we refer to them as that are trauma responses. When a life or death situation presents itself, there are typically one, two, three, four responses that we give. We call them the four Fs. The first one is to freeze. You, you, you've heard of that. It's synonymous with being paralyzed by fear. It is a trauma response. Fawning is a trauma response. The endeavor or the pursuit to try to befriend your attacker. It is a trauma response. But then everybody in here, maybe you didn't know about freezing or fawning, but we all know about fighting. Can I talk to you in here? There's some of y'all, don't look around because I don't know who you sit next to. I don't know if they got warrants right now. So just look at me and smile, all right? But there's some of y'all in here, you were anointed to fight. Oh yeah, come on. Don't play me. Uh -huh. You ain't been saved all your life. And if you tell the whole truth and shame the devil, you ain't been saved ever since you've been saved. I wish I had a talk back church here in this temple. And some of you, you liked to fight. You, yeah, uh-huh. There's some people, you, you have a mindset. You go places and you say, I hope nothing happens. Ooh, I hope. I'm going in this part. I hope nobody acts out. I'm going to the, I, I hope nobody shows up. I hope nobody acts ugly. But then there's some of y'all, you didn't hope, you wished. You said, I wish somebody would. 
Mm, trauma response. Yep, yep. Uh -huh, I see you. Uh -huh, some of you, I ain't hoping, I'm wishing. I wish, uh, not that somebody's soul would catch on fire. I wish somebody would say one more thing. Mm, because you like to fight. And for some of you, it's a trauma response because fighting has been the only way you have survived. Are you listening to me? But I'm here. I'm here. The Lord told me to speak peace in our church and tell you that for some of you, the struggle is over. Mm, I just heard the Lord tell all my fighters in this house, sit down. You don't have to fight. Why? Because the Lord said for those of you that will shout about it, the battle's not even yours. No how. It's the Lord's. Uh, you, you've got freezing. You've got falling. You've got fighting. But then uh, the fourth trauma response is flight. Freeze, fawn, fight, and uh, flight. And uh, that's what David is highlighting here in the 55th Psalm. He says in the middle of this uh, uh, passage of scripture, he says, I wish that I had the wings of a dove so that I could fly away. David, this great man of faith, David, this warring king. David, uh, this priest and praiser. David, uh, this one after God's own heart, finds himself in these first six verses uh, explaining how depressed he is. Uh, and let me free somebody in here. Don't you let nobody tell you that you can't be saved and wrestle with bouts of depression. Mm. I wish I had a witness in here today. Don't you let nobody tell you that something is wrong with you because uh, you've got the Holy Ghost and life still lives sometimes. Uh, don't you let nobody tell you that something is wrong with your salvation if you have some dark days where you don't want to get out the bed because uh, here's my question. If you can't be saved and have moments where you wrestle with your humanity, uh, then let's throw David all the way away. You're not going to talk to me in here because David says, I am distressed. My soul is fallen. He, he's complaining about what's going on because he's wounded. But I want you to hear me very clearly because God said to tell you, hear me, that wounds have roots. Are you listening to me? Wounds have roots. Sometimes we look at people and we judge them. We put them in a box because we can see their wounds. And sometimes, you know, wounds will bleed and sometimes you don't want to deal with folk because uh, you see they're bleeding on social you see they're bleeding every time they're coming but can I tell you let's go deeper don't stop looking at the wound understand that there's a root to the wound and when you look at David's life he's writing this psalm at the end of his days but look at his story David has been rejected by his own father you remember that when the prophet comes to Jesse's house and says as there's a son in here that's going to be the king. Jesse didn't even think enough of David to, to invite him to the table. Trauma. Your own daddy throwing you away. Trauma. But it didn't stop there. He ends up in the palace of Saul. Saul should have been a mentor to the young up-and-comer. Saul should have been one that could elevate him and raise him. Ah, but Saul ends up jealous of the anointing that's on David's life. Saul cannot handle the fact that he's in the same house as his replacement. Uh, but can I, oh Lord, I'll tell him, tell your neighbor, say neighbor, the replacements are coming. And tell him, say, you might be one of them. You might be one of them. Uh, yeah, I know that you've been locked out and access has not been granted, but God's about to raise up somebody to take things to another level. Saul can't handle it. And he ends up trying to kill young David. Trauma. He goes further in his life. He's married to a woman and he's in a loveless relationship. You know it because when he dances back into the holy city after reclaiming the ark of the covenant, his wife that shouldn't have had herself downstairs outside dancing with him, she's upstairs in the window with her little arms folded looking and judging him for his praise. Now she was a princess and so she matched but she did not fit. 
Huh, I want to preach. I really do. And some of you all are dealing with some trauma in your life because you connected with people that you matched with, but you didn't fit. Uh, they looked like they went to church, but they didn't have the heart you got. They looked like a praiser, but they was on their phone half the time talking about people across the sanctuary. But I need you to look at your neighbor real quick and sing it from a pure place. Say, neighbor, in this season that I'm in, I don't care if you match. I need to know do you fit. If you're going to be my friend right through here, you got to fit my future. You hallelujah can I give you a 10 second test to find out if you're fitting in on the right roll I want you to open your mouth and give God a quick praise and see if they know what to do with it some of y'all need to get your purse and your flat shoes and move cause when you say holly your neighbor ought to say hallelujah when you say thank you they ought to say Jesus when you say Lord I they ought to say love you can you open your mouth and make sure you got the right fit on your rope? Uh, clap your hands and shout hallelujah. Uh, David uh, is traumatized because uh, he's in a loveless relationship with somebody that he matches but he does not fit. And then uh, he goes on. He gets older and his own son Absalom is his name. One day tries to steal the very kingdom that God has trusted David with. Uh, somebody saying trauma. And now all of this trauma has stacked on top of each each other just like some of you it's not this alone sometimes we see people uh, and we see a blow up we see a breakdown we see a meltdown and we wonder how is it uh, that they couldn't handle that let me help you you don't know what that was piled on top of uh, God help me in here some people are at their breaking point can I preach like I'm the pastor that's why you got to be careful how you talk to folk around here you better hear what I'm saying some of these folks that smiling they got a lot going on underneath that smiling you better have some discernment when you walk around here talking crazy because some people are at their breaking point their wounds have roots and David now he goes further in this 55th Psalm and the Bible says that he writes this help me Corey after one of his friends has turned on him in other words this is a psalm that is written after a personal betrayal the Bible says David tells us in verse 12 and through 14 it says it was not an enemy that reproached me then I could have borne it no it was not the one that hated me then I could have hid myself he says it was thou however a my equal my guide and my acquaintance in other words he says I would have been fine if it was my enemy but it was my familiar friend and I'm preaching I'm coming into the station here in a moment but I'm preaching to those of you that need to understand that some of your betrayal or some of your trauma is rooted in betrayal would you help me preach it here everybody just say betrayal Oh, you got to talk about it here because psychologists will tell you that betrayal is one of the worst kinds of emotional pain that anyone can experience because, let me help you, this is what makes betrayal so bad. This is what makes betrayal hurt so much. You ready? Betrayal never comes from your enemy. You're not hearing what I'm saying to you. I'll say it again. Betrayal never comes from an enemy. It only is able to come from somebody that is a friend. That's what makes it so difficult. It's not the enemy that betrays you. It's someone that you befriended at one point. And let me help you. This is why some people that you look at and you would write them off as antisocial or they funny acting. They just don't like to talk to nobody. No. Can I help you? Sometimes it's not that I'm antisocial. I'm just anti-betrayal and you look too much like the last one that hurt me. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. 
Uh, let me talk to those of you that are in ministry. We have ministers meeting coming up on Sunday, on Saturday. Let me tell everybody that wants to be used in ministry. You got to ask God to keep your heart from getting broken. If you really going to serve God's people. Because nobody endures betrayal like those that have an anointing on their life. You mean to tell me I'm going to help you? I'm going to pray you through? I'm going to give you money? I'm going to do all of it. I'm going to keep your secrets. And the moment you don't get your way, you're gone. Oh, God, that, that, that gets hard to deal with. Are you listening to me? And David says, I'm hurt because I'm betrayed by somebody that I thought loved me. And this leads us into, I got three things for you. There are three things that I have to warn you about then. If you're going to navigate and overcome your trauma, here's the first one. Those that have been traumatized, get this, have to make sure that they avoid avoidance. Uh, did you hear what I said? You've got to make sure that you avoid the trap of avoidance. When we talk about avoidance, avoidance is typically considered, here's what the National Institute of Health says, avoidance is a maladaptive behavioral response to excessive fear and anxiety. Watch me. Leading to the maintenance of your anxiety disorders. In other words, when you avoid, you feed your trauma I want to preach to somebody that will hear me this is why when David says I wish I had wings like a dove to fly away and be at rest what he was flirting with was the temptation to walk in avoidance and in you when you walk in avoidance you nurse your trauma can I talk to you and anything that you nurse is only going to grow I'm preaching I feel the Holy Ghost giving me strength here I'm preaching to somebody and telling you uh, that sometimes even how you respond in church uh, is not real praise, it's avoidance. Uh, you're trying to run from something that God's trying to fix uh, but you keep avoiding the issue uh, and you're trying to shout over something uh, that God wants to take out of you. Uh, I'm preaching to some of y'all in here and this avoidance uh, is why you keep going uh, and delaying your growth and deliverance uh, because you won't sit down long enough and be real with God and say Lord it's not my mother it's not my father it's not my sister it's not my brother it's not the boss it's not racism it's not this it's not that God I need you to work on me I'm done running from the issue I'm done running from what happened I'm done running from what I went through I'm done running from what I avoided all of these years and tried to suppress because I realize that until I face it, God can't fix it. But I need you to look at somebody and prophesy to them and say, neighbor, if you're willing to face it, I need you to preach to them. Tell them if you're willing to face it, tell them God is able to fix it. Ah, yes, God. Tell, tell that other role. Tell that other role behind you, in front of you, around you. Tell them, say, if you'll fix it, or if you'll face it, tell them, say, God's going to fix it. He says, number one, you've got to avoid avoidance and be real with God and say, Lord, this is what it is. But number two, here me uh, the second temptation and trap for the traumatized uh, is the temptation of resting uh, help me preach it in unsafe spaces uh, ask somebody to tell somebody as a neighbor I don't mean to be in your business uh, but ask them say where have you been resting your head Ooh, yeah okay let's talk about it here your Bible says, David says, he says, I wish that I had wings like a dove. He doesn't stop there. Verse 7, he says, if I have these wings, catch it. He said, I would wander off and remain in the wilderness. Wait a minute, David. What do you mean you would wander off and waste or rather live in the wilderness? What do you mean? Don't you understand that there is never a possibility? Positive connotation to wandering off. You know, you give your sister heal, mother. You you've given your children. They've given their children instructions. When we go in this store, come here. You better not wander off. 
Okay, some of y'all, you're talking about trauma. Some of y'all just got traumatized right there. Because your mama told you, when we get in here, don't ask for nothing. Don't touch nothing. Y'all, okay. Don't look at nothing because you're not getting nothing. Uh, God help me if some of y'all walk through the store now with your hands in your pocket because you still traumatized from what happened when you was nine. But let me talk to you. You knew as a child not to wander off and you also know enough to know that the wilderness is not a safe space. So what David is saying here is that because of my trauma, I'm floating with the idea of resting in an unsafe place. And I need to talk to you because what trauma will do if you let it is force you to let your emotions lead you. Ah, come on, let's talk in here. Some of you, because of the trauma that you have endured, some of you, because of the trauma that you have suffered, you have become emotion driven instead of being spirit led. Oh yeah, I know I'm telling the truth. You know why you lost your job? Because you were emotion driven. You went in there and you just had to give them a piece of your mind. And now look at you. You and that piece in the unemployment line. Oh, y'all not going to say nothing to me in here. You know why you got that felony? Uh huh. I'll tell you, you caught a case because you were emotion driven and not spirit led. You know why you ended up wasting all them years in that dead end relationship with that low down so and so that your mama told you not to talk to, your pastor told you not to talk to, your brother told you not to talk to. But yeah, I just gotta follow my heart. You should have sat down somewhere because everything that feels good. It's not good. Feelings can be fatal. Mm. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I can't rest in unsafe spaces. I'm preaching over you right now and I declare that, yes, God, I'll tell him. For everybody in here that has been resting in an unsafe place, I'm praying that God exposes the danger. You're not talking to me like I need you to. Lord, they won't ask, so I ask for them. Show them who's really around them. Because you've got too much purpose to keep resting in an unsafe space. I don't need no more unsafe relationships. I don't need no unsafe boo. I don't need no unsafe friends. In this moment, my destiny is too important. Lord, if you don't want it for me, I don't want it either. Hallelujah to God. But then he said to tell you that you've also got to deal uh, with not only the temptation uh, of resting in an unsafe space, uh, but there's the temptation of isolation. Uh, because whenever you allow yourself to get isolated, uh, isolation makes you vulnerable uh, and dangerous at the same time. Uh, what the devil wants to do is isolate you uh, and get you by yourself uh, so that he then can make a fool uh, out of you. What the devil wants to do is get you alone and by yourself so that he can tell you that nobody loves you. That's why when you're going through the devil would tell you not to come to church. When you're going through the devil would tell you you might as well stay home today because nobody at that church even loves you. But I can't just to tell somebody at the temple on the day that the devil should have killed you before you got here because the fact that you made it to church today is breaking the stronghold of isolation look at somebody and just say name you're not by yourself tell them say you're not by yourself tell them say I've got you covered today and I'm going to be your intercessor to make sure that the devil don't make a fool out of you have I got a witness in the house today but whenever you're isolated you're not only vulnerable to the attack of the enemy 
but you also get out of character <laughs> because David, 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 <laughs> he began to pray a selfish prayer <laughs> and said, Lord, <laughs> what I want you to do today <laughs> is I want you to kill my enemies. <laughs> Can the church say, yeah? <laughs> he said, I, I, I want you. <laughs> I wish I had a church that would help me preach uh, to kill my enemies. Uh, and that's where some of y'all are. Uh, you've been asking God to destroy those that are against you. Uh, ain't the Lord all right? Uh, but God said that because of the anointing on your life, uh, you've got to learn uh, how to do what Jesus said uh, and pray for those uh, that despitefully use you. Uh, have I got a witness in here? But I want to tell somebody that even though you've got trauma, even though you've got trauma, you've got to understand today that it's only a trap to get you to leave your assignment. It's only a ploy to get you to leave your destiny. It's only an attack. I, 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 I. To get you off your mark and off your square. But tell, tell your neighbor, I don't know about you, but I won't fly away. You only come to have no church. You only come to have no church. You only come to have no church. Y'all ain't come to have no church. Give me just a little bit of organ. But is there anybody that'll get some hand sanitizer and rub it in real good? And why don't you just lean over and grab your neighbor by the hand and say, I don't know about you, but I'm going to stand still and I won't fly away. What the devil wants to do is get you to ignore your trauma so that God never heals it. What the devil wants to do is get you to leave your place so that God never heals it. But I want to tell somebody, you ain't got to run this time. Just leave it alone. That's what the old church saying. Leave it alone. Oh, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Oh, leave it alone. God can handle it better than you can. Leave. Leave it alone. I said, leave it alone. Take your hands off. Stop trying to hide it. Stop trying to fix it. And just let God do it. Because the last thing to tell you is that when you avoid and when you fly away, you rob God of a chance to vindicate you. Can you say, yeah? Look at your Bible here. David gives you a pass to walk in some humanity because he confesses depression. He confesses anger. He confesses resentment. But it don't stop there. In verse number six, he don't stop there. In verse 15, he goes all the way to verse number 16. And this is for the shouters here. He said, after being depressed and after wanting to quit, he said, here's my resolve. I will call upon the Lord and he shall save me. Verse 17 said, even in morning will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Grab your neighbor's hand and shake their hand and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, oh neighbor, oh neighbor. Say verse 16 is the only reason 
I haven't gone crazy. Say verse 16 is why I didn't blow my brains. Verse 16 is why I'm holding on. I got a promise that he shall save me. I got a word that he shall hear me. I'm preaching to your trauma. You were ignored. They minimized you. They wrote you off. But God heard you. You were abused. But God heard you. You cried out for help. But God said, I heard you. And because I heard you, I'm clipping your wings. You can't leave this time. I'm clipping your wings. You can't quit now. I'm clipping your wings. You can't run away. I'm clipping your wings. Look at your neighbor. And say, neighbor, I wanted to give up. Wanted to let go. Wanted to throw the towel in. But say, I, 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 I'm so glad he clipped my wings. If he didn't clip me, he couldn't have worked on me. If he didn't clip me, he couldn't have pushed me. If he didn't clip me, he couldn't have healed me. I'm so Lord. Hear my work on me. I'm giving my trauma work on me. I won't keep nursing it. Work on me. I'm turning it over to Jesus. Shadi. Touch three people and say he clipped my wings. I can't give up. I can't quit. I can't let go. Can't throw the town in. Can't escape. Can't give up my assignment. I'm gonna stand still and let God work on me. Yeah. Everybody stand up. Without the music, I want to hear the sound of those that believe God just transformed your trauma. Open your mouth. Go, 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 go. Let me hear you. Hands up, mouths open. Hands up, mouths open. Those that are able to stand are standing. Lord, clip my wings. David says, here's the message. I wish I had wings like a dove why because if I had some wings I would avoid and can we tell the whole truth ain't nobody here but us some of you thank you Deacon some of you have been praying Lord I wish I had wings because if I had wings I'd fly away from this I'd if I had wings I'd give up on this if I had wings y'all never see me again but the message today is that God says, I'm getting ready to clip your wings. Why? Because you can't fly away from this this time. This is a message about the danger of avoidance. And a lot of us in this room our coping mechanism for our hurt and for our pain and for the abuse and for the mistreatment has been to do what David wanted to do, fly away. I'm going to, if I, if I act like that didn't, didn't happen, then nothing happened. No, 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 no. 
All you're doing is taking your trauma to a new destination. This is why some people change churches every three weeks. I'm stuck in a cycle of avoidance. This is why some people, can we tell the whole truth? This is why some people can't keep no healthy relationships. Romantic, platonic, professional. Because whenever, whenever I see something that reminds me of what was, I fly away. And the problem is, at some point, you can't keep flying. You're going to have to land somewhere. And it is not until you land that you give God an opportunity to work on what you've been running from. David shows us the danger, number one, of avoidance. But then he also shows us, you ready? The danger of looking for rest in unsafe places. Ooh, I'm preaching right now to some of you all that have been looking for rest in places that are not safe for your spirit. Look at your Bible, verse 7. David said, if I had wings, I would wander off and remain in the wilderness. That's trauma talk. I'm going to wander off and get lost in a wilderness. What am I going to eat in the wilderness? Where am I going to live in the wilderness? Who am I going to talk to in the wilderness? But you know what trauma does? Trauma makes you feel like anything is better than this. And when you rest and unsafe, I'm preaching right now. I'm praying that God break up some relationship. I know y'all don't, oh God, what you mean? We want God to put things together. No, no, no. He can't put the right one together until you let him break up the wrong one. And some of you, because of the anointing that's on your life, you can't keep resting in unsafe places. I don't need people that don't support what God's trying to do in my life. No, no, no. I don't need people that are going to judge me for being spiritual. Oh, you so deep. No, you shallow. You're not safe for what he's doing with me right now. I, 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 I'm not mad at you. I'm not bougie. I'm not stuck up. I'm just too old to play games. You're not safe right now. I'm too hungry for a move of God to stay with your dryness. You're not safe. I love you. I'm not mad. I'll be back later. But right now, there's something I need. There's some inner healing I need. And I can't get it in an unsafe space. wish that I could wander off and stay in the wilderness. But then David shows us the danger of isolation. And that's what a lot of traumatized people do. We isolate. We isolate. Now, anybody that tries to help you, you draw back. You isolate. And you don't mean no harm. It's just that the last person that you thought was a friend stabbed you. So now better, I feel safer by myself. The problem with isolation though, join hands is that it leaves you both vulnerable, David, and dangerous at the same time. You're vulnerable for the devil to get in your ear and tell you whatever he wants you to hear. Because you have nobody around you that loves you enough to counteract the wrong. But you know what the danger is? The danger is when you're by yourself. Now, don't, don't say man to this too loud because I don't want you to scare your neighbor. But you know good and well, if, you left, if you're left alone for too long, You've had some moments where you surprised yourself with what you cooked up. Come on. When you had too much time to scheme and think, you shocked yourself with some of the stuff you plotted. That's David. All that anointing. And you know what he prayed? Lord, please send him to hell. Y'all thought y'all was the only ones that knew how to cuss. David said, this, this is some Old Testament cousin. He said, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick in the hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. God, kill all of them. And no, don't, don't, don't wave your hand. But you know, good and well, some of y'all, shh, don't tell nobody. Some of y'all have prayed a similar prayer. Lord, if anybody breaks, gotta go out. I got a list. Lord, I want Willie Watkins' funeral home to stay. Bless their business, Lord. In this seat, bless their business. I got a list. The problem with that is that kind of prayer 
does not match your potential. Jesus said, you got to learn how to pray for those that despitefully use you. But here's the last point. I'm getting ready to pray. Altar workers are coming very quickly. When you're bound by your trauma, when you avoid your trauma, you rob God of a chance to vindicate you. David goes through all of this cycle. Lord, kill them. Lord, I'm depressed. Lord, this isn't fair. But you know what he lands on? Thank you, Jesus. He lands on verse 16. He says, as for me, I will seek the Lord. For he shall save me. I want to tell everybody here that's facing some level of trauma. After you've cried. After you've prayed. After you've tried. After you've done all you can. Seek the Lord. He says, I will call upon the Lord and the Lord shall save me. Evening, morning, at noon will I pray. Hear this and cry aloud. And he shall hear my voice. Can I speak to those? Yes, Lord. Can I speak to those that are facing some trauma right now? One of the things that intensifies your trauma is the feeling that you're in it by yourself. You know one of the things that weaponizes your trauma? The thought that nobody hears me. Some of you are screaming with your mouth closed. Wondering why nobody sees. Some of you, you're grown now. But something happened to you in an early age and you still wonder how is it that nobody around me had enough awareness to see someone right. Nobody heard me. Nobody saw me. Nobody helped me. That's why I find comfort in verse 17. The Lord shall hear my voice. God says, I'm giving a voice to the voiceless today. But it's only going to happen if you refuse to fly away. Lord, clip my wings. I want to be better. I don't want to avoid. I want to heal. Give me the grace to face it. Now hear me. I am not denying what happened. But I am denying what happened. The right to control. We're not going to lie. No, nothing happened. I'm fine. No, no, no. I'm not fine. It did happen. But I declare it will not control me. Because I stand here, wings clipped, ready for God to work on me.